everybody who's watching and thank you for joining us. This is the Social Responsibility and the Small Publisher panel. Um, this panel has come about because of recent controversies and ongoing issues within the RPG industry. Noticeably of the, the James Desborough um, situation from a few weeks ago um, which suddenly sort of brought things to a head but there's also been long-running um, discussions about um, say the depictions of women in RPGs and to a lesser extent race and a few other questions of what's suitable and what isn't suitable to be in RPGs. The purpose of this panel is not to look at the specifics of any particular case um, because those arguments have been done to death and quite frankly we're a little bit bored of them to I think. What this panel is about is the big issues about you know, do we as publishers, as writers, as creators have any sort of responsibility to the gaming community, to the market, to the, to the environment we live in at all? Or, are, or can we just go ahead and do what we like and it doesn't matter? So this is about the big issues. Um, we're going to run through some sort of hypotheticals, just as jumping off points. The details of hypotheticals we look at aren't important. They're deliberately implausible because I didn't want to get bogged down into how <coughs> or about the nitty gritty details. What's important is the big issues these questions raise about when and when we shouldn't publish something and what we should do if we feel that someone is publishing something they shouldn't publish. So those are the um, big questions. Um, join, joining me uh, tonight, uh, we've got um, Chris, um, who from Dortmund and uh, long-time writer, blogger, creator. Okay. Uh, we have Emily, who uh, isn't Thank Emily you. on the camera. <laughs> this, this is Emily. <laughs> yes, this um, is me. Flame jammer artist and general all-round good, all good egg. Uh, we have Thank Loki, um, another... Have a writer, creator, Loki, you should sort have of, uh, come under that category, I suppose. Yeah, the, uh, the, the most recent project was I was a designer on Open Design's uh, Dark Roads and Golden Hells, the Pathfinder planar supplement that just came out a few days ago. Uh -huh. And finally we have Jim James, um, who um, is a, a game publisher and writer like myself. So, that, that's the group. We are a diverse multinational um, uh, panel. We, several members have got storms in their areas and things, so people might just disappear. <laughs> so where I want to start here is just a quick question for each panelist. Um, I'll go right through you in turn. But it's just a straightforward personal question. Is there anything you personally wouldn't write or um, be involved in? Any topics you think are, no, I'm not going to touch that with a sort of level? So, um, Emily, is there anything yes. you won't touch? Uh, well, as an artist, I mean, if, if there was anything I wouldn't draw or whatnot, uh, uh, I mean, I've got, I've got my personal standards, you know, where if, if somebody asked me to draw things involving, you know, like child pornography or something, I would say no, you know. Yeah. But that's that's my personal issue. Yeah. I, mean, I I can't stop people from wanting that kind of thing, but I can say no myself. Yeah, you can you can um, mm. exercise your right to say no. You're going to turn down that work. Yeah. I mean, is there, is there anything if if you're doing a project purely for yourself? Is there anything you, you know you uh, avoid other than the sort of ones you've already mentioned? Uh, n no, not really. Uh, I'm willing to 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 draw just about anything as long as it's within the realms of good taste. <laughs> mm. uh, what about you, Loki? Where, where are your uh, limits? Well, I, uh, I, I write professionally and not just in the gaming industry, so due to career considerations, I, I have to be somewhat restrained in what topics I will get into from a design standpoint. Um, there are a lot of things of a sexual nature or things uh, like, uh, a, a, as I see as a manager on planewalker.com, we, we often get discussions going about trying to uh, convert real world religions into gaming terms. Uh, things like that I, I have to steer clear of because of my other writing. By Backwards. The same, yeah, by the same token, though, 
I uh, I think that you know the the wonderful revolution that is the internet. The the thing that's at the core of it is that it has given everybody their own printing press, and anybody can address anything out there if they want to. <laughs> Um, I don't think anyone should be in a position of being the final arbiter for everybody's content, but it's rather a moral and ethical question of where do you draw the lines with what you produce. Yeah, I mean, we all we all have that control over our own production by and large, um, and yeah, and sometimes you might want to push into areas which, you know, are sort of more of dubious taste, but your career and pers and uh, business concerns you have to avoid, that's a fairly reasonable. Uh, Chris, uh, where are you on, on, is there anything you, um, you avoid? It, <coughs> it's really hard to say, you know, without something concrete in front of you. Um, the last game that I worked on, um, I designed a game for the, the Wayne Foundation um, fundraiser this year. And one of the options that I had in the game was allowing people, if they so desired, to play uh, sex workers. So, you know, obviously my boundaries are probably a little wider than some. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, quite a, a broad palette. And then finally, Jim, where, where are you on this subject? <laughs> yeah, uh... I can't think of anything offhand that I would reject as far as a subject for you know writing or publication. Uh, there might be certain treatments of certain subjects, but then we're getting into context. But as a blanket statement, I mean, you know, there's really nothing that I know that I wouldn't touch. So that you know, if you thought you could do something well, even if it was a topic a lot of people found distasteful, if you thought there was some creative merit in what you were doing, you would do it. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I've had people saying stuff I've already published is, you know, socially irresponsible, <laughs> if you'd like. You know, uh, you know, anyone watching this can go look up uh, Lamentations of the Flame Princess and Something Awful uh, through Google or whatever and look at their, uh, you know, and look at their review of my game and see some of the art that's in there. Carcosa has had some controversy on it, so... Yeah, I, I've already done stuff that people say is uh, out there. Yeah, yeah you're very much of a sharp end of um, this debate, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. N next, want to move on to really sort of like getting into the meat of um, this panel. And in thinking about social responsibility, it, it occurred to me, you know, first of all, the question is, is there such a thing as social responsibility? Uh, mm -hmm. That's the, it's, it's a big question, and of course the answer to which will greatly shape really the rest of this discussion. So I have a hypothetical here where a small press publisher um, produces an RPG just to bring a PDF on their own website, and let's say, and this PDF deals in some respects with underage or um, borderline um, sexual activity. So the, the example I've come up with is that it might be a game where you play teenagers, you know, 13, 14 year olds, and the object of the game is to be the first person to lose their virginity. Now, <laughs> you can say it's tasteless, but it's probably legal in most people's that, um, worlds or countries, and so, you know, it gets out, this game gets out there, people start playing it, and then one day a tabloid journalist happens to come across it. It's a slow news day, they want to f generate some headlines, and before you know it, we have a big scandal like we had in the 80s. You know, D&D &D causes, um, role-playing causes uh, children to have sex and all these sorts of things. And out of, out of this, school clubs, school RPG clubs get shut down just because the whole idea of RPGs isn't relevant. Shops which sell RPGs get harassed from their local community and things like that. So we have a situation here where a game has been published and it's caused real harm to the whole gaming community. Each of us as professionals and publishers in the field would be affected by clubs and s stores dropping um, RPG products. So really the question is, having done some harm to the gaming community, can we really blame the publisher? Have they done anything wrong here? Can we complain about what they've done? Or is it, well, they've published the game, that's their right, we can't say anything. So, 
Jim, I'd like to start with you. You know, is there something? You know, can we complain about what another publisher has put out, even if it's done us harm? Um. Well, I mean, you can always complain. Uh, I don't know whether the complaints would actually have merit, uh, because that would really be treating role-playing games as something different than any other media. I mean, when you think of what's out there as far as you know, literature and you know, regular books, you know, th there are things that are way out there that you can get off of Amazon, but that doesn't, you know, affect the success of. Uh, you know, Stephen King or the Hunger Games or, you know, any of the other big bestsellers. Just, I mean, just look up Eraserhead Press on Amazon <laughs> and you're going to see some really out there stuff that goes everywhere. Uh, and at the same time, you know, I uh, think of movies. You know, you've got things like a Serbian film, Cannibal Holocaust, I Spit on Your Grave. And the idea that those would have, the idea that those hurt cinema for everyone, you know, I, I think a Serbian film has been shown in the same theaters that later went on to show the Avengers here in Helsinki. So, I, yeah, I just, yeah, you know, sure, it's possible that something would get out there that gets attention, and that negative attention would. would <coughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I would consider that stupidity on the part of the media rather than the fault of a small publisher doing what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, one thing I want to uh, point out is sort of a redirect, that, you know, you already in mainstream media, you have programs like Skins, which was hugely successful and popular in the UK, and th which covers that sort of subject matter, and it was successful enough that an American version of the show, which uh, didn't succeed to do as well, you know, came along. So I don't see why mainstream media should be okay with these sort of things, and at the same time, gaming should be held to some sort of a higher standard. I mean, to to give it sort of like, um, there are some sort of real world examples where um, publishers have hurt other publishers in terms of, say, if you look back to the history of comic books to the sort of like, you know, 40s and 50s had full of sort of horror and uh, shock factors in them. But, and then because of that, the Comics Code Authority came in and completely killed it as an art well, form. Well, a little, a, a little known yeah. fact is that the Comics Code Authority rules actually were DC Comics in-house uh, guidelines for comics at the time. Yeah, but the fact is that... Um, they were already the, producing comics the, to those standards, so it didn't actually impact them. It, it did, because the, um, the marketplace um, very much changed after those came out in terms of sort of what the board of publishers. You can see an awful lot of small independent horror comics just disappeared off the face of the market. And, and, and there's, the a, and there's, context. there's uh, a substantive difference between those sort of regulations being in-house rules at DC and those sort of guidelines being imposed as a cookie cutter, this is what you can and can't do, to every other company out there. That is a massive difference, and it was a, a huge change to the industry. It put a lot of people out of business. But also, I mean, at the same time, a lot of those comics were crap. I mean, there was a reason why a lot of those comics went out. I mean... There were, in the 1940s and 1950s, there were, there were hundreds and thousands of people trying to, you know, exploit the comic market, and they'd come out with, like, a title that would last, like, three issues, and then they'd go, oh, well, this didn't make us money, and they moved on. Yeah, so that not, sort of skews those... Well, that's no, the, but what I'm saying the, is that that sort of skews those statistics. Yeah, there were a lot of comics that failed, but there's a lot of reasons why a lot of those comics fail. But, but Chris, well, the, the, let's try and get back on track if we can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh. so the, the, point, the point here is that, you know, th there is the potential that, um, you know, a publisher can sort of sour the marketplace or, you know, and, or affect the larger marketplace. Well, now, I don't see someone I, selling... I think, sorry, Chris, if you let me finish. What? Okay. As, as, as the, um, you know... Because this can happen, you know, this is just an example of social responsibility. Do we have to think about when we publish something, you know, is this going to bring the whole gaming community in disrepute? Is it going to look bad? Um, um, Emily, you want to sort of come in? Well, uh, there has to be a point where the consumer takes some responsibility for what they buy. 
I mean, we can't, I mean, a anybody, we can't make anything and out of, out of fear of, well, somebody somewhere might construe this wrong. I mean, we just, our focus should be on making a good product that we feel is worthy and then letting the, letting the consumers make judgments based on whether they feel that's right for them or not, whether they should purchase the said, said item. And if it's not their thing, then they should leave it for other people to decide and just not purchase it. I mean, not purchasing something or writing bad reviews is one thing, but making sure that stores close down because you didn't like that one product they sold and removing that ability for anybody else to choose, that's just not right. I would like to plus one Emily right now, by the way. Ah, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it's not a feature, is it, on that? Hang on, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this oh, is... I if, it, if I may be so bold, um, I think that uh, you know we're we're looking at uh, we're looking at the issue of social responsibility um, on on one level with the the publisher and what they should put out there. I think that an important aspect of this is uh, the social responsibility that we have across the board to be able to create the best possible environment for the widest array of content to be out there. As Judge Rehnquist said in the Larry Flint trials, uh, when he acquitted him of obscenity, it is useless to legislate taste. No one's ever going to agree. Uh, political humor is a great example of that. Something I might find hilarious would send people I know into a killing frenzy. You know? But that does not mean that we, any of us, have the right to create one central authority, much like the comics code, that does nothing but stifle creativity. Yes, there are always going to be things that happen that you don't like. There's always going to be content that you think is terrible. Market forces can, market forces can deal with that. And as far as the, the, the idea that this is disruptive, this hurts the industry, uh, that's speaking of the market as though it's a static thing that never changes. Anybody who publishes or, or works in the field knows that that's not the case. There are constant ups and downs. Those are just some of the bigger ones, and that's part of the package you get into by being an indie publisher. I was looking up uh, obscenity laws earlier today, trying to do some research for this, and just I mean, even even the federal government just put their hands up in the air and said, "Fuck it, we can't figure out what it means to be obscene." <laughs> we're going to leave it to each state to decide. So depending on where you go, one person's obscenity is another person's artwork. Yeah. Uh, think, 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 about, think about the comparison between what someone in, say, rural Ohio would think is obscene, whereas, as opposed to someone who's in the middle of Mardi Gras in the French Quarter might think yeah. is obscene. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the thing is, um, always. Yeah, there was this, this issue when it came up in the sort of British courts in the sort of 60s and 70s, much like it did in America, and there was a wonderful quote, I think it was by one of the um, barristers concerned in a big test, test case, you know, what is obscenity? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, whatever gave the an <laughs> election. <laughs> <laughs> that was his taste, and, uh, you know, that's a pretty good rule of thumb, you know, it is mm -hmm. whatever does his buttons. Just moving on to the uh, conversation a little bit, um, I mean, we sort of touched this already about sort of um, the sort of it's there's a marketplace out here. It's what people spend their money on. If um, is it okay for a publisher or a writer to turn around and whatever the criticism of their work is to just to turn around and say, "I made money from it. That's all that matters." Is that an acceptable response, George? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Lucky. I think I think that it's a reprehensible response, but that does not make it an invalid one. And we all know it's one that you're going to run across. Um, you know, as always, you've got the the letter of the law on one side, and just like game rules, people are going to try and min max the best they can to work around that and do whatever they want. <laughs> You know, that's just human nature. You see it at your gaming table. It's the exact same thing at a greater scale. Absolutely. Uh, James? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know that making money is actually a good benchmark because 
you know, I, I know, uh, especially earlier on, the things that were selling the most for LOTFP were not the things that I thought were the best. And so, you know, I made money. That could be one defense. Oh, people like it. But at the same time, even if it's something that loses money, you know, this is a this is a creative thing. You can look, you, you know, people release stuff that loses money all the time, and yet they'll stand behind it, and they like it, and they're proud of having put it out. So, yeah, it made money. You can say, yeah, some people like it, but, you know, that, that's not necessarily the barometer to use on whether something's any good. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris? Um, I think I'm just going to say I agree with James. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think I have anything else to add on that. I mean, I, I agree, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm um, well, I mean, a, lo a lot of companies, you'll see, they'll have that disclaimer where they say, you know, the, the products or the people who work for us don't reflect the views of the company and whatnot. I mean, as a publisher, uh, their only obligation is to put out a good product. And whether it's offensive or not is up, like I said, is once again up to the consumers. I mean, they can't be the judge of it. As lo the only thing they can judge is if it's a quality product that they think will make money. Whether something is morally reprehensible or not is up to us to decide and not purchase or purchase, depending. Uh, you know, although although I, I think that uh, some labeling of the product might be appropriate, I, I oh, put yeah. some you know adults only disclaimers on my stuff because really you know surprise illustrations of genital mutilation you know not cool yeah. you know, yeah. but something yeah. lets I, people know you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I, I like that. a warning before genital mutilation. Well, yeah. <laughs> what, 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 what I'm curious about and and that has has puzzled me constantly every time this issue has come up is why do we see so much furor over these sort of topics in gaming as compared to Naked Lunch, Lolita, um, whatever that Fifty Shades of Grey is, the book, oh, God. book oh, movie, like HBO. I mean, come on, come on, guys. Look at Game of Thrones. Just watch an yeah. episode. Yeah. <laughs> the gaming industry has been a scapegoat since the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as someone who's been playing since, since the 70s, you know, I, I, I remember having a priest thread in the throat, holy water on me because I gamed. It's just like anything else. You know, you're never going to like everything that's out there, but the best weapon is actually educating people so that they can find what they like. You know how I got a Dungeons & Dragons club going in my high school when I was in, in Del Sal in the 80s? I got the religion teacher. It was a Catholic high school. I'm in New Orleans. <laughs> I got the religion teacher to be the proctor so she could monitor it. And after about three months, she walked into the principal. It's like, yeah, they're demons and devils and stuff. These guys are playing knights in shining armor, killing them. This is fantastic. And they're learning teamwork and reading <laughs> and math skills into the bargain. This is great. It's just like racial hatred or, or any of the other failings that we have as humans. Education and familiarity knocks mm -hmm. down a lot of the problems. Oh, heck, I used it in daycares helping troubled kids. So, <laughs> I mean, just just to sort of come back on uh, Loki's sort of uh, comment there. I mean, there certainly is a great deal of double standards about gaming. It does seem to be that um, we don't, um, you know, we're, hi we're hypocritical about this, or society at large is hypocritical. Um, but I think also there is a genuine sort of. Um, Learning pains we're going through at the moment. I think as a, I, I think gaming is, has the potential to be an art form, just as like you know theatre or books or anything like that. And if you look at all those um, mediums, they've all gone through the same process, where at some points they've started to question themselves as what is appropriate, what is um, a good thing to show. And we saw it in sort of TV in the seventies, where you had very little racial uh, diversity where you had women in very limited roles and because of social pressure this, this sort of discussion it changed to something which is far from ideal but it's certainly better than where it was mm -hmm. so while I think there is a lot of hypocrisy I also think it's part of the process we have to go through in order to become a better medium well, well sorry yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. well uh, what uh, 
What I was going to say is, um, I, I honestly, I think that there's a big difference between how um, how genders and cultures are treated and the portrayal of sexual content. Um, the, there is a lot. There are people that that have a a bias against any sort of sexual content, and it isn't just you know in gamers. There's a lot of that in the mainstream too. And I mean, like in our country, it is perfectly acceptable um, to have a movie where you show somebody being beheaded. And but if you go, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I just in the middle of it, I thought I couldn't hear. Anyway, well, um, it's perfectly acceptable. That I mean, it's perfectly acceptable, you know, to cut someone's head off. But if you show a naked woman, or heaven forbid, a naked guy, you know, it's like, oh my God, save the children from this. But you know, mm -hmm. we have we have absolutely no problem with you know the portrayals of violence. Um, and I, I think it's in a lot of it, it's just a case of priorities that we really, you know, yeah, there are bad things in the world, but there are, you know, th there are some things that should be addressed and some things that, you know, probably shouldn't be. Yeah, I think there's things lower down yeah. the list, certainly. Yeah. I think, I uh, just want to sort of move on to sort of, just um, actually we've picked up a couple of comments on the Indie Plus, which I'll sort of feed in as we're discussing. Uh, actually, Michael, uh, Michael R. Um, he sort of um, asked a question, which is where I'm going to um, now, which is a question he asks is, what is an valid, effective way for people to say they like to see more of X or Y from a publisher, large or small? And that's what I want to come on now, which is about changing the status quo. Um, where there is a dispute about sort of what we might call social responsibility or what's socially expect acceptable from a publisher. Um, and what is the way to go around changing that publisher's uh, point of view? Um, now, say, hypothetical, a publisher puts, you know, only features white characters in their artwork or possibly puts ev all their women in chainmail bikinis. It, you know, it, what the issue doesn't matter. But there's a small minority of people who like the game but don't like the artwork or the, some sort of aspects of it. How does that minority go about um, changing the publisher's point of view? What, it, what is the mechanism they, it's acceptable for them to, to pursue? Um, and um, Jim, what would it, you come in on that? Uh, well, really, if there are certain things you like and don't like, uh, the best way, I think, to reach a publisher is to do a public review or go on the publisher's forum or whatever contact method they have, something that's in public so you can't just hit the delete button, but do a constructive review, something that, mm -hmm. that points out that you're a human being, then you're actually putting forth a viewpoint, and you're not just some big ball of rage picking up on, you know, mm -hmm. your, your, your favorite pet topic of the week, uh, something that show you know some sort of response that shows you're giving your individual opinion you do not just some mouthpiece uh it doesn't sound like you're a mouthpiece for some uh you know for, for some agenda that's going on around there uh going around because once you do that it's very easy to ignore you you know you get you know 5 6 10 20 people that that are all going from the same playbook you know it's like oh, look at this bunch of robots screw them you know it's, it's very easy to do so, yeah, being respectful and pointing out why you, you, you feel the way you do, but having that personal touch, I think, is the most important thing because it's a wide Internet out there, and it's just so easy to tune things out. And a publisher already understands that no matter what they do, there are six and a half billion people on this planet that aren't going to care. So, you know, why, you know, you have to really make an effort to... Uh, you know, point out to the publisher why they shouldn't just shuffle you into that six and a half billion category. You know, why why should they listen to you? That's yeah. I, you got to appeal to you know the the publisher's sense of taste, and not necessarily their 
you know, social responsibility. Uh, because what if somebody's really inspired by 70s fantasy art? And that's their whole reason why they got into the fantasy publishing business. And they remember the Savage Sword of Conan. They remember the Red Sonia comics. So when they see Chainmail Bikini, they don't see sexual <laughs> exploitation. They think, yes, powerful woman, kill, kill, you know? Yeah, so, that'd be me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You come in here, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is, you know, where, where sort of, you know, how do people go around changing opinions? Uh, oh, goodness, I mean, uh, like like you said, I mean, if you have an issue with with a publisher or a game, you, you need to talk to somebody calmly and like another human being and express express your issues to them and speak to them on a human level and see if they can understand what your issues are and if if they don't if they don't understand then there's always other games well, I mean, this is sort of one to come with what I'm going to follow up on with you is sort of yeah I mean okay you, you do the proper thing you, you go to the mm -hmm. publishers and very sensibly explain what your issue is and the publisher uh, turns around and says um, sorry this is what we like this is what we're doing now, as a you know, as a fan, you might like the game, just not one aspect of it. You you want to keep playing the game, you want to keep buying their products, but mm -hmm. you don't want this thing to be in it. Now, how do you step this up? Is it appropriate for someone to start organising a campaign, getting peti petitions together to say, publish a change? You know, emphasising, um, making the, their message larger, louder. Mm -hmm. Well, getting your message across is fine. It's when you cross that point to where you're stopping other people from making their own choices. That's when it gets too far, I think. It's okay to not like things, but it's it's not okay to start telling other people that they shouldn't be doing things. Yeah. What, what, what if what if the the minority? Is saying is explaining the issue. Now they set up a website or web post saying, "Look, this is the issue with this book. This is why I don't like it. I want this is what I want the publisher to do," and encourages other people to contact the publisher. And they're going out building up uh, a, a group who will campaign to get this publisher to change their attitude. Is it appropriate for a, someone to do that to try and influence a publisher, Chris? It's appropriate, but that doesn't mean that the publisher has to listen. I mean, you know, there's, you know, th they have every right to say and do as many things about stuff they don't like as much as they want, and you know, the the creators have just as much right to say, uh, you know, I, I respect your opinion and um, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I and, but I mean, and they ha and you know, there comes a time when you you have to go. Well, you know, I might not like it, but that's the answer I'm going to get. So. You yeah. Know. Okay, L uh, Loki, you're coming in there. I I, I was just going to say I think that that one thing that should be pointed out is that if a publisher decides to put out content that is controversial, be it religious, sexual, whatever, just controversial across the board, they need to be committed to backing that and preparing it because. Uh, someone who works with uh, information online a lot, no matter how innocuous your topic is, you'll find people that are going to troll you, and you are going okay. to find people that are, you know, every once in a while you run into that person who decides to make you their project for no adequately explored reason. But you've, you've got to be prepared to stand your ground. If you put enough work into the editorial process to make sure you put out something that was solid, you should back that and back that play. Um, this is why, as much as I love Mongoose's stuff, I'm sorry to see that they let the artist in question go. I, uh, I, won't I talked on to one. James. It didn't really yeah. have anything to do with that whole issue. Okay, it, all right. It was well, just then, a then coincidence then I feel of better timing. About that. Because yeah. that, that, that was the buzz that was running around. I mean, I, I think the problem with Mongoose is that the way they communicated the situation was far from ideal. Yeah, the timing was bad. That they happened to stop working together at the exact same time that that whole drama was going on. Yeah. All right. Well, then, well, then I rescind my example, but uh, I think you understand my point. Yeah. Um, we, we and, can and, and, people have caved. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's these it's these publishers out on the edge doing things that are not popular 
necessarily or that are controversial that are vital to the evolution of game development as an art, just like Tropic of Cancer being banned all over the U.S., uh, again, back to William Burroughs, Naked Lunch, stuff like that. These are all things that people, Clockwork Orange, Stanley Kubrick, and Anthony Burgess. You know, these are all things that were classified pornography, trash, garbage, etc., and 10 years later were considered classics. You know, the, the fact that people are going to be upset and that there will be market ripples is by far a distant second to having an environment that has the bubbling creativity which does usually, in my opinion, originate out on those edges, out on the, the dangerous visions like Harlan Ellison had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about, I mean, I'm a firm believer that, that big change, all the good stuff comes from the grassroots, from the edges, and we absolutely have to support this every way we can. I want to sort of pick up on something, because, you, you know, we were talking, you are talking about... Um, you know, shouldn't cave in, they should stand by their work and um, whatever. But we were talking earlier that, you know, that saying following the money is a reasonable thing to do. Now, if a publisher is facing a situation where they're going to lose money if they support an artist or whatever, surely they've got, uh, you know, a, they've got a responsibility that just in their right to dump that uh, person as a hot potato and say, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 get rid of him. We're not like him at all or her. Um, and, you know, just take the money. Um, so but, but that's, the ethical, that's the, the ethical balance here between when you should follow the money and when you shouldn't? Well, in, in, in my opinion, that's, that's simply the, the age-old, eternal, and never-to-be-resolved uh, dichotomy between profit and integrity that you run into. Myself, I tend to find integrity far more profitable than profit. Yeah. Mm. Well, that also assumes that the people doing the complaining are actually a part of the market. You know, yeah. I, mean, um, I, I, I would imagine that you know James can, uh, probably has more uh, citations than any of us. That you know, there's a lot of people out there that are complaining who either aren't a part of his target market or have never even you know picked up games like Lamentations. Mm -hmm. No, Jim, yeah. you're really coming here because obviously you've probably got the most first-hand experiences and people act really cr complaining about your work. I mean, yeah. how do you ethically, you know, address the situation? Or how how do you, you know, what sort of things do you respond well to? Well, first of all, you know, leading up to the release of the Grindhouse edition of LOTFP, which I think is where I really started, uh, you know, pushing the envelope quite a bit, is... Yeah, I, I did a lot of uh, promotion slash warning slash hype on my blog, you know, my, my core audience. You know, this is the sort of stuff that's going to be in there. And, you know, again, that's what I was saying earlier, you know, just releasing stuff by surprise when people think that they might be picking up, you know, generic role-playing material and then, ah, you know, you, you don't want to do that to people because, you know, there are people that are legitimately bothered by it and so you want to let them know, stay away. Uh, but the fact is, for me, it wouldn't be any fun to release stuff if it was all very safe and non-offensive and, you know, for, for kids. You know, that, that's just not where uh, my creativity goes. You know, and, and the gaming industry, you know, there aren't millions of dollars floating around for any one person. You know, the... the <laughs> you know, the paycheck's not people. enough for me to sit around and... Yeah, yeah I mean, the... There's just not enough money to make me think that, you know, I should uh, suppress my creative impulses to do what the market wants and, and to have that be satisfying in any way. So if I'm going to be more of a niche publisher because of what I choose to do, then, you know, that's the way it's going to be. I just have to hope I find my audience. And then, you know, people that don't like that, there are literally a thousand other games out there for them to go for. So... I'm just going to throw in a comment from the um, uh, from Google Plus, uh, which is uh, Vincent Baker uh, makes a, a very valid point. I take it as my social responsibility to make games that don't conform to conventional social standards, and I think that I, su I suspect that fits very well with you, Jim. In, in that you know it's you know it is it is important for us as writers to push the envelope as it is to sort of respond sensibly and intelligently to sensible feedback. I would endorse that. I don't, 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's the responsibility of anyone to push the envelope. I, I think there are going to be a large number of writers out there that <laughs> naturally conform to what uh, people want to see because, you know, the average is going to have this, you know, that's going to include writers <laughs> as well as the audience as far as what people want to see, what people find acceptable. So it's not a duty to push the envelope. I think it's more of a duty to... Uh, you know, just trust your own creativity and follow that. And if that leads off the path, then it leads off the path. If it's, you know, right into the heart of what people want and expect, then, you know, that's, that's good too. You know, more power to them, the lucky bastards. I think the real responsibility of, game, of designers and publishers is just to produce the games that they want to see out there. And, you yeah. know, if, if other people happen to like the, you know, those things that they put out, then, you know, awesome. If not, then, you know, like James said, there's thousands of games that are out there, you know. If, yep. if, this, one, if this one isn't what you want, there, there's plenty of other uh, fish in the barrel. Mm -mm. I mean, this is a good point to sort of move on to the sort of next general topic, um, which is pushing the envelope. Um, now, one I wanted to look at here is sort of beyond us as individual publishers and writers and look at the situation from the point of view of the of the common stores. People like RPG Now and Amazon and things like that. The people who don't vet the work which is put up for sale on their things, they just say, right, we, as long as it conforms to basic legality, you can sell anything through us. So this is sort of in a different situation. They're just opening up and let anybody sort of put publish things through them. Now, here's the hypothetical. Let's say someone produces a game about the slave trade in the 1800s, which, let's face it, we all know is hideous and, you know, and representable and whatever. Now, by its nature, a lot of the game content is racist um, in order to reflect the subject matter. And inevitably, when you play this game, you end up espousing, you're saying things which are racist, in character, whatever. Now, this is the sort of work which will generate controversy. And let's say you are RPG Now or Amazon or whoever, and you have this controversy building up. Now, the question is, what does these, these common stores, these common carriers, have to think about in how they respond to this criticism? Should they just say, we're open to everyone and just let it in, even if it's actually deliberately horribly racist? Should they consider how much money it makes them? Or should they look at the author's intent? Was the author intending to be offensive and racist? Or it does his intent not matter? Um, so from, from the sort of RPG Now people's uh, point of view, where is the social responsibility um, and how do you exercise it? Emily? Well, I mean, uh, I was, uh, when I was talking to, to Stuart earlier, he brought up an example of uh, on RPG now with some uh, gaming supplements for hot chicks the RPG <laughs> yeah a and there's yeah and there's these pictures you know bad CG pictures of women in tentacles and all this kind of stuff but uh, as I'm looking at it I mean there's all these warnings about how you got to be over 18 to even look at it. it it says in five different places adult content only the, the pictures are suggestive, but don't actually show anything lewd. So, I mean, all the proper, all the proper information is there, so the consumer can say, well, this might not be something that I'm interested in. So they can go and move on. I mean, so, I mean, so, so some, of the, some, some of this comes down to the question, some of the, the, the stores with bonds, mm -hmm. is just the person selling the product. If they're selling it and putting proper disclaimers on there and explaining the situation, you would say that it's perfectly okay that the store should continue to carry this controversial content. Well, yeah, I, I don't see why not. I mean, it, it's not like these games are telling people to go riot and go cause harm or to cause violence against people. They're just games. You know, uh, how, how we let them affect us is, is our choice. It's not the responsibility of the game. I mean, or the retailer. 
Oh yes, or the retailer. I mean, uh, I was uh, when I saw your example about the slavery game. Uh, I was I went started looking on the internet and discovered all the controversy about a video game that was made about slavery. And there was all these people talking about uh, how good it was because it let people understand what it was like to go through those situations and to understand it on a deeper level. I mean, there, as long as these things have some sort of artistic integrity and purpose behind them, and they're not just thrown out there as schlock, you know, in order to shock people, then I say they should be able to do it. Uh -huh. um, Chris, you know, Emily, Emily sort of put forward the thing there here that, you know, the, the author's intent here, the, you know, the fact that they're trying to be creative and, you know, have some what we might literally in value to their work rather than just being right-wing nut jobs or whatever. Um, do you think that makes a difference? Do you think the, the author's intent makes a difference to how we should view these products? <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can't really look at a product without looking at, or not a, a product is the wrong word to use, you can't look at a game without looking really at the intent of how it's supposed to be used. And, you know, a lot... Uh, Gamers have a habit of, of using games in the wrong way as it is anyway. And so, you know, you can't really you can't really penalize the, the creator because somebody is is using their materials in a way they that wasn't intended or that they didn't mean for. Okay. Um Sorry, I was just going to check in the comments. Um, uh, Jim, um, sort of, you know, yeah. do, you know, does, does, does again, let's look at this question of money. You know, if, if you are sort of the store and the product's se selling well, is that a good enough excuse to wash your hands of any sort of ethical considerations about the work? Uh, not necessarily, although I think it really, uh, you know, uh, well, personally, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis of when something has gone too far. But when you have something like RPG Now or you know, a store like Amazon, they should really have a concrete set of standards so, so publishers know ahead of time, this is acceptable, this is not. You know, if something fits you know, the, the, the standards of one of these websites, one of these marketplaces, I, I think it's uh, really bad form to try to change the standards in the middle and yank products. I really don't like that, and I, I don't think the. Uh, I really don't think that having an evil product, even if it's something done purely for shock value, really harms anything else on the site or the site itself. Again, as long as things are properly labeled, you know, I, I was just going through my bookshelf, you know, I, I am talking about some of this stuff because I just got into it and just started receiving it the past month, but, you know, off of Amazon, you know, like the, the big, big retail giant, it's larger than anything role-playing would have to offer, you know, I got books like uh, Genital Grinder, uh, here's a lovely <laughs> one, Baby's First Book of Seriously Fucked Up Shit. I uh, love that. <laughs> And I ordered, you know, and I ordered from my local retailer, book retailer here, a book called The Haunted Vagina. <laughs> and so... I've heard of that. Yeah. And, and somehow, somehow these stores still exist. You can go right now to Amazon or your local retailer and order these books. And these things, well, I haven't finished The Haunted Vagina yet, but I will say that Baby's first book of series... I look forward to your review. And, and Genital Grinder, uh, you know, I also bought the uh, Kobold Wizard's uh, Dildo of Enlightenment Plus 2, uh, you know, at the same time I bought these, you know, and, you know, some of, some of this stuff, you know, some of it is... is you know, pretty good, and some of it is just there to pile on the shock and the disgust, and you know, and, and again, you know, Amazon's not mm. collapsing, so yeah. if RPG Now is selling something that's a bit uh, off-color, shall we say, who cares? People that 
don't care about it will not buy it. It'll disappear. You know, I bet the people that get upset about it give it more publicity than anything. I mean, there's, there's yeah. going to be people that like, you know, music that shocks people, whether it's, you know, Marilyn Manson gets all the bad press. You know, yeah. this you know, 10-year-old example now, but, or, <laughs> or now, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the outrage will get, uh, you know, will get it publicity, and there will be people that like the sort of thing that pisses other people off so they'll check it out. Yeah. And that doesn't hurt anything. I mean, people are going to do what they're going to do. They're not going to suddenly read a book and go, oh my god, I'm going to become a Nazi now. You know, yeah. There's... I mean, I, th I think... Um... Well, well, especially not from entertainment media. I yeah. guess I should... Uh, I, guess I guess I should differentiate between something that's pushed by a politician yeah, and something that's so presented that, in that's a game. The there's a difference in expectations. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So what I say, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, j low key. I mean, I've sort of um, some brought up that so, um, Jim brought up the fact that we can walk into bookstores and buy all sorts of things um, as we like, and no one raises an issue. No one seems to have a have a problem with that. Is this because the battles have already been won with bookstores and um, and and films and other medium? In that, you know, if you look back to the 50s and 60s, when there was an awful lot of social and government control of what was acceptable, we've fought those battles and we've won them. Are we just fighting those battles out again here in the RPG world? Well, I I think that. Uh I think that saying we've won these battles is a, a statement I can't really agree with. Mm -hmm. uh, I see it more as an, an ongoing process. I mean, the uh, cultural mores and cultural tastes tend to ebb and flow, and with them, these sorts of issues and discussions tend to ebb and flow. Um, I think with gaming... A lot of the reason you see so much furor is particularly among older gamers like myself, you have that fight-or-flight reaction left over from the 80s when everyone had pitchforks and torches and crosses and was after D&D &D and such, you know. Um, and it was never more popular than during those days. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and, and it, it, it was interesting because you could see the effect. Uh, I mean, back then D&D &D was... 90% of what was going on. And then you had, you know, Mazes and Monsters comes out and all of the rest of this. And that's when they yank the devils and the demons out of the monster manual. And then when they bring them back in Planescape, they rename them Tanari and Betezu because that deprives the, the radicals who had a problem with it of their, their keywords. But culture moves on, tastes move on, what's acceptable. I mean, my God, why are we worried about any of this when you've got crap like Saw on big screen? Seriously, yeah. yeah, no, I mean that, that's what I find to be a little silly about it. <laughs> and yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have loudmouths uh, on any side of the argument who will whip up a sudden frenzied following. The right thing at that point is for the people that are on the pro side to whip up a frenzied following and show the publisher that they support that particular variety of content. You know, I mean, publishing publishing is, is Darwinian. It, it, it's it's business like. It's survival of the fittest. You know, you, you can you can talk about it in whatever aspect you want. But the most important thing to game publishing across the board is having the widest array of of available creativity and directions that it's going in. You know, anytime you censor something or crop it, you're really making a mistake. It doesn't matter if it's gaming or anything else. Yeah. Well, and one other thing, to, uh, you know, back in back in the, the days of the, the, sa the big satanic scare, um, D&D &D was, as J uh, you know, Jim said, it was everywhere. I mean, I remember in like, you know, 79, 80, being able to go, you could buy D&D books at a gas station. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, D&D &D was everywhere. So at that point in time, you could almost, I mean, I, I really don't like using these sorts of arguments, but you could almost have a, a rationale for the whole think about the children because, you know, at that point in time, kids could literally walk in and go, oh, what's this? I mean, might, I, know, might I interject but, one, uh, one side note? Yes. Uh, 
I think that that perception on your part may be something that's vaguely colored by geography. Because oh. my experience in the middle 70s and 80s here in New Orleans was that I could go to the one gaming store in town, one B. Dalton, and one Walden Books, well. and those were the only places you could find anything, and you had to go to the gaming store if you wanted dice. And it was like that up until 1990 or so. Um, I just, well, I, I grew up in, in small town Indiana. Indiana. So, I mean, that well, wasn't exactly. But I mean, you know, anyway, I mean, the, I mean, my point is at that point in time when D and D was a lot more prevalent, there could have been a, you know, okay, I can understand why you might be concerned that a kid's going to wander into some place and go, ooh, you know, this is mm-hmm. something that. But nowadays. Gaming is no longer everywhere. You know, you can't go. I mean, you can you can hardly find a you know a successful, thriving chain bookstore anymore that has more than like three or four gaming books in it. So you know, you have to like search this stuff out. And the the odds of some you know like twelve year old kid doing a Google search and finding, for example, Jim's Lamentations game is pretty. Oops. <laughs> Oops. I, I think God is down. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would wager while well, he's off the line to, to, to add to his thought that I'm sure that the Googling kid would find a lot of other much more controversial target topics before they got to the flame princess. Uh, the, there has to be a point where they stop expecting us from raising their kids for them, too. I mean, whether the product's available or not, parents still should be able to teach their kids what's right and wrong and what's acceptable and what isn't and let them make those judgments for themselves or to, or to make sure their kids aren't buying violent movies or, or, or doing incorrect things with games and whatnot. I mean, we're, our only responsibility is to put out a good product that we believe in. I mean, the rest of the responsibility has to be taken up by the people where it belongs, the people who buy the product and the parents and everybody else. I th- I th- Are kids I- buying role-playing stuff at all these days? Uh, I, I mean, you know, preteen yeah. kids, does that mm-hmm. exist as a gaming demographic anymore? Yeah, we have really a gaming store, you know, right around the corner from my house, so I'm there quite a lot, as you might imagine. Um, okay. And, yeah, there is a thriving sort of age group from sort of like 12 to 18, sort of that sort of market is quite big. And we do have kids as young as 9 and 10 coming in and, and playing games. So, you know, it, it does exist in places. Um, so, yeah, I mean, something we're sort of... a uh, um, a, a topic we could pursue further. We are now at sort of one o'clock, well, one o'clock my time, I should say. We, we've, we've had um, a, good, a good hour on on this. I feel um, personally, I, I've um, sort of enjoyed it, and I thought it's been quite interesting. I'd like to thank you all for taking part. Um, I'll just go very, very briefly round everyone. Sort of like if you can just think of us sort of like one, two sentences, just to sort of sum up, sort of your opinion or, or where we are. And I'm going to start with Jim, because he's on the far end from my display. So, Jim, just give us a, a wrap-up from your point of view. Okay, I think that anything goes from a creator standpoint. Uh, just let people know what you're doing, so if they really wouldn't like it, they know to avoid it. Mm-hmm. And so that the people that would like the stuff know where to find it. That sounds good. Loki? I think that my position can can best be summed up by saying that I would be far angrier at a distributor for presuming to choose what I am not allowed to buy than I would buy something that offends me or is not to my taste. Mm-hmm. Very good. Emily? Uh, goodness, I don't know if I can sum it all up. <laughs> but, uh, a, God. But, yeah, um... Okay, go to somebody else. Let me think for a second. <laughs> well, I don't know how much help I'm going to be for Emily because my my summation is pretty uh, much it's okay to not like things. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good argument. But yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I agree a, a lot with James and Chris. Or if you don't like something, that's fine. But don't take away my choice on whether I want to like something or not. Okay, I think which is a good, uh, good time to leave it. Um, thank you, Chris, Emily, Loki, and Jim for taking part, especially Jim, who is at a god on awfully hour um, <laughs> over there in Helsinki. Thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you all at some later date. Uh, thank you.